Um, okay, hi. I, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, 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 audible. I, yes. I can hear. I hope to everybody. Is there uh, anyone from the audience? Okay, so um, I am starting anyway. So thank yeah. you so much, uh, Professor God, for giving me this opportunity to address the students of the uh, Virtual Foreign Policy School. Um, so um, I am Ashwini. I belong to India, uh, to Kerala, and I am working as assistant professor in the University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun. Um, so here there is a, a new school of liberal studies where uh, I am working in the area of international politics and India's foreign policy. My PhD. Uh, was about this particular thing that I'm talking to you about um, on India and the Indian Ocean region. I basically looked at the maritime security of India um, and what are the basic challenges that we were uh, facing, the geopolitical, the strategic and the non-traditional um, threats that India was facing in the Indian Ocean region um, and what are the opportunities that lay ahead for India in the region. So that was what my PhD was about. Um, and I currently write in the area of uh, security, um, the non-traditional security, especially environmental politics. I am particularly interested in uh, energy politics, like how countries create basically their renewable energy policies. Um, and uh, I'm also um, in analyzing the, in, the Indo-Pacific policies of uh, these countries. So I'm really glad uh, to talk to you about the Indian Ocean politics today. Um, and so um, as, as we all you know, so that, yeah. So we all know that Indian Ocean is like a very vast theater of uh, geopolitical drama, which kind of consists of uh, almost um, one fifth of the um, of the water on the Earth's surface. And uh, the Indian Ocean region is also one of the most densely populated uh, regions in the world. And it contains around one third of the world population. Um, and Indian Ocean is also one of the, uh, it is the third largest, um, you know, among the world's oceanic uh, division. And uh, this region is also kind of blessed with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, natural resources, right? And it's also uh, physically a bit complex compared to the other oceanic regions uh, due to a myriad of, um, uh, you know, um, the, the archipelagos, the islands, the narrow straits where basically these oil tankers must pass each day, right? And navigating the dense traffic in the region. Um, and as I said, it is the third largest uh, water body um, in the world. And this, the area uh, in the, the Indian Ocean region covers is around 70.5 million square kilometers. And um, it holds approximately 20 percentage of water on the Earth's surface. Um, so as you know, um, I will go to this uh, previous, um, sorry. Yeah, so to this um, image, to the map, if you look to the, um, uh, to the, if you look at the, this Indian, an entire Indian subcontinent here on the north, right, you see to, to, towards where like, if you could see the cursor, this is the Indian Ocean region and to its north, we can see Indian subcontinent. Right and Africa, you can see to the west, Australia on the east and south by the Southern Ocean or what is called the Antarctic Ocean, right? And it is physically one of the most complex of the worlds, as I said, because of you know extensive marginal seas, straits, bays, choke points, and archipelagos. So if you look at this picture here, Arabian Ocean, uh, it lies to the north of Indian Ocean region. So it's bounded by Pakistan in the uh, Pakistan and also Iran on the north, right? And on the west, if you see, you can see the northeastern part of Somalia. Do you see here like a small minute thing in my map, which is like protruding outside? So uh, on the western side, so that's northeastern part of Somalia. And you can also see a bit of Arabian Peninsula in this picture. And on the east, the whole Indian subcontinent. So this region, this Arabian Ocean region. So here we have the Jawaharlal Nehru port of Mumbai. 
You also have the most famous Gwadar port and the Karachi port of uh, Pakistan in this region, right? And also, if you look at Oman here, you can see the port of Salalah and see that these are basically all the major seaports in this region, okay? And if you look at the Arabian Sea here, this region also, um, you know, contains multiple islands like Socotra Island of Yemen, you have Messia Island of Oman, you have our Lakshadweep um, island chains here right so and also if you look at here the oman next to oman you can see the gulf of oman and on top of that here next to iran here is the persian gulf so it's on the extreme uh, north and it is connected to the strait of um, hormos okay which is a very narrow choke point and we will talk about it when we talk about the politics um, of uh, indian ocean but understanding this geography is so important when we talk about indian ocean politics because when we say Indian Ocean politics, we are actually talking about geopolitics. And to understand the minute aspects of the politics of this region, you have to clearly understand the geographical uh, layout of the region. So that's why I got this map and I'm trying to explain to you all those minute things um, over here. Okay, So all these regions right are extremely significant everything that i told you on towards the western side is extremely significant in terms of trade as they provide the shortest route that connects europe middle east and south asia so now let's look at the western side of the um uh, you know um, indian indian ocean region so here do you see um you know island nations like um um, you can see Seychelles, Mal uh, Seychelles Island here, Mauritius, Madagascar, unfortunately, it's not in this picture, in this map, but over here near Seychelles, you'll also see Mauritius and towards the end, you will also hear Madagascar here, okay, towards the African coast. Um, and here to the eastern side, if you look, you can see um, Bay of Bengal, right? So Bay of Bengal is lo located in, on the northeast region of the Indian Ocean okay and it's the largest bay in the world with Bangladesh here you see in the north Myanmar on the east right and Sri Lanka and India towards the west so here if you look the major seaport in this bay includes um, ports of Chennai here look at the eastern coast here ports of Chennai ports of uh, Vishagabatanam Kolkata in India and ports of Chittagog in Bangladesh. So here towards um, the very, very, uh, you know, eastern side of this, if you'll also see the Strait of Malacca between, do you see here between Sumatra and Malaysia, there's a narrow strait that goes, which is the most popular uh, or, uh, you know, the, the talk of the town kind of uh, the Strait of Malacca. We'll talk about that uh, in some time. It's one of the most important shipping lanes in the world. And as it provides the shortest route, to connect Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, right? Now, okay, all right, so I basically talked to you about it. Now, let's just uh, look at a little bit of history of this region, right? So the the the, the story of um, Indian Ocean region. Now that we all studied in, in, in school, right? Like you talked, you studied about the, the colonial uh, times when first, the Vasco da Gama came, uh, the Portugal, um, you know, the entry into the Indian subcontinent after Arabs for the first time, how they kind of mastered the monsoons and reached here and slowly following them, the Dutch came and uh, excuse the spelling here for British. So following Dutch, the British came. And until 1880s, we see that the entire uh, Indian Ocean region was kind of like acting like an in English lake, connecting um, in, uh, the Greater Britain to the, uh, you know, to the entire Asia and the Southeast Asia. Now, until World War II also, the, the region was used majorly by Britain to kind of decide a lot of wars, a lot of um, uh, political steps that Britain has taken. Now, when you look at Cold War, when you look at Indian Ocean during Cold War, you also see that USA and USSR also has accurately used the Indian Ocean region for their own geopolitical advantages. Now, what happened was to, by 1990s, <clears throat> after the USSR disintegration happened, there's a big, there was a big power vacuum that occurred in 
the Indian Ocean region. Now, to fill this, this vacuum that occurred, there's a lot of political struggle, a lot of power struggle that's happening in this region. Though here I've written power struggle between India and China. Of course, it's a major power struggle between India and China, but US is also one of the key components of this power struggle. Right. So we have to kind of understand a little bit of the story again to kind of make meaning about why uh, Indian Ocean region has become geopolitically so significant. So no matter what we are going to talk about today, the blue economy, the, the trade, the commerce, the natural resources, no matter what, of course, all these things are important, but one of the major reasons why the compared to other oceanic regions, why Indian Ocean suddenly is having all these problems is because of this power vacuum that created. So there was no continuation of a particular power uh, uh, system that is being followed in this region. And seeing a vacuum, every country wants to fit in and fill in because this region can benefit them because of the location of the region as a very important route connecting Asia, Middle East and Europe. A lot of countries want to get a uh, you know, tad this bit of uh, uh, this region. Now, um, I'll come back to this picture when we talk about the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean region, okay? Now, do you see here um, um, the maritime choke points that I've talked about here, right? So since, uh, in, since last few dec uh, decades, if you looked at the Indian Ocean region, uh, this region has witnessed a lot of uh, dramatic shift in their economic and strategic level, um, you know, leading to rising major powers, assessing the, their own kind of immense potential of influence in the world affairs with the rising economy and a lot of stable, um, you know, and, and open choke points are therefore at the heart of international trade and security in this region. Now, what is a maritime choke point? Okay. So choke points are basically points of uh, uh, natural condition okay, or a narrow channel of uh, shipping having high traffic. Now, um, if you look at this picture, if I could go back and now you look at this picture. Uh, so there are some uh, choke points that's kind of highlighted in this picture, right? So do you see here next to Iran on top, like if you see on top Iran, do you, do you see a Strait of Hormuz? So Strait of Hormuz is the world's um, most, one of the most important choke points as there is like, there's an oil flow of almost 17 million barrels per day in this region. So what happens if this particular choke point, like a particular narrow channel of shipping, what happens if this gets blocked? It would inflate, like because if it gets blocked, what happens? There won't be any ships that would be able to pass through the strait, right? So what would happen is that, and Strait of Hormuz, things are not going much there from the Middle East, from Central Asia, a lot of oil ships are traveling out of the Strait of Hormuz. And if we block it, it would inflate the oil prices and kind of affect the energy security of every country. Right now here towards uh, below, do you see the red, red color point here next to Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden? Small one here next before the, um, the um, um, yeah, Djibouti, do you see here this one? Okay, so this is Babel Mandab. So here, this is also kind of called as a, a gateway of, um, you know, tears. It's like a trivia. So basically, because it's, it was earlier, you know, it's located in between Middle East and Africa. It was one of the most toughest uh, passages for ships to kind of, you know, um, cross. So it was called a gateway of te uh, tears because um, of the day with navigation through that that road that route now closure of uh, Babel Mandab Strait could kind of keep all the tangers which is originating from the entire Persian Gulf right from transiting towards the Suez Canal now and also do you see towards your eastern side eastern side of the Indian Ocean here as I discussed earlier we also have something uh, some strategic location called Strait of Malacca. It's one of the main shipping channel 
between Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. And if this is blocked, 90% of China's oil imports and trade would get affected. And that's why we also, in Indian Ocean politics, we talk about the famous Malacca dilemma, right? So one of the biggest, biggest reasons why China is expanding in Indian Ocean region is because of the Malacca dilemma. And China is kind of very, very worried about any geopolitical transitions that happen. And this region kind of gets blocked. Right? The entire supplies um, would collapse. Now that we have talked about the first point here, which is the maritime choke points of Indian Ocean, right? Let's also talk about the um, all oil and gas reserves of the Indian Ocean region. So Indian Ocean region contains around 40% of the world oil and gas reserves, right? So around, like if you look at um, um, like the data, like I think I have the data here. So Indian Ocean holds around 16.8 percentage of the world's proven oil reserves and 27.9 that's 30 percentage of the proven natural gas reserves in of the world right and if you also look at these resources okay what are they they are uh you know you look at like let's say let's also look at um the uh the uh, natural mineral resources so uh, minerals like nickel uh, cobalt, iron, and all these manganese, copper, zinc, um, silver, and gold are present in sizable quantities on the seabed of Indian Ocean region, making it again a lot significant to many other countries to have a taste of the region, right? And when you look at fisheries and due to warm water, so as I said, one of Indian Ocean region is one of the warmest waters in the world, right? So due to warm waters, we are a nice good breeding ground for fish and Indian Ocean accounts for almost 15 percentage of the total world fishes and um, it has kind of created a good market for uh, Indian industries, Indian fishing industries, fisheries to export to other countries. All right now Okay, now when we look at the um, the uh, Indian Ocean region and the the politics, right? The politics behind the Indian Ocean region. Now we understood the geographical situation of the region. We understood a bit of history from where, why the politics is kind of like brewing up to a lot of geopolitical and very strategic in nature. It's because of all these reasons that we talked about. Now let's look at the the, the politics of Indian Ocean. Right? Now, the region's politics is important from three perspectives. One is Indian perspective. So India has a lot of big power ambitions in the backyard of, um, you know, because Indian Ocean is in the backyard of India. This is one of the only oceans which is in the world which is kind of named after a country. So, and also India has um, a lot of ambitions to grow as a big power. Right? And for assisting India's growth uh, as a world power, Indian Ocean is very, very significant, right? Now that's one perspective that we have to talk about. Now, the second one is that uh, ever since the disintegration of Soviet Union, um, USA kind of started like, you know, it was like one enemy down and USA became like the world kind of started um, operating in a very uni, um, 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 you know, polar way, like not a bipolar world, a unipolar way. And ever since the US has kind of become a hegemon in, in, the, in the global politics, what happened was that US attention uh, kind of started fading away from Indian Ocean region. Earlier, US had used this region for a lot of uh, geopolitical gains. Now it has just reduced that and it started uh, giving more attention in Europe and in the, the Pacific and the Atlantic region with a very, very less attention in Indian Ocean. But ever since last 20 years, we see that US has started, um, you know, pivoting, basically pivoting the whole policy uh, around its, its concerns towards Asia another way and started 
giving a lot more attention to this region, India and Pacific, and which the um, which um, apparently would have should have been called uh, Asia Pacific, but US calls it India uh, Indo Pacific. Right now, that US has a lot of. We will definitely talk about what are the US uh, Asia pivot policies under Trump. Obama and the uh, the current government right now we also need to this is another perspective that that we will look at and uh, the third perspective that we will look at is China's expansion to Indo-Pacific so China has been like a sleeping giant until um, a, a couple of decades ago and then we see that China is kind of rising in power and there's a lot of uh, conversations um, around China's intention in the Indo-Pacific right so we will talk a little bit about that also and I'm really hoping to uh, you know discuss more of uh, uh, these three perspectives uh, with you after in the FAQ session now, India's big power ambitions in the um, uh, IOR, right? So the Indian Ocean Basin, if you look at, is of very, very particular importance to India for India's growth. And as we know that in this region, so India is one of the most populous country in Indian Ocean region. Um, so there is a lot of uh, Indian Ocean is also a very important geo geographical, geopolitical keystone for India in its growth uh, trajectory um, and although india um, has been long preoccupied by a lot of uh, uh, it india has always been a very continental um, uh, power right like one of the reasons why um, these um, colonizers reached india like including britain was because the indian powers were uh, okay sorry about the power here uh, i hope you can but still see the um the the screen okay so um and if you just um look so the, india has always been like a very um very uh continental in perspective and india kind of ignored a lot of india's sea uh ambitions and sea powers and sea rules right so because of these continental considerations um, India could like kind of affected India's big power ambitions. Now, if you kind of India has started if with policies um, uh, such as Sagar Mala and Sagar, right? So security and growth for all in the region. Sagar with such policies, uh, India has started reevaluating its priorities in the Indian Ocean region. Right. So one of one of the key areas why Indian Ocean region can kind of be the biggest support for India in its big power ambitions is that it is at the location of the of the crossroads of global trade, like the trade routes. And it's also connect uh, connect India with the international economy. Right now, not just trade and commerce and the blue economy. Right, like the fisheries, natural minerals, and everything that we basically talked about. This also provides a lot of employment opportunities. Indian Ocean creates a lot of employment opportunities, especially given the high rates of economic growth that India is having the ambition for. And for developing countries such as India, okay, Bangladesh, right? So all these developing countries in the to, towards the coastal side when we look at the demographic distribution there are so many youth in these region which are looking for opportunities of growth and the this region can basically support the 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 uh, the citizens of this of india towards creating employment opportunities and as I discussed earlier, 40% of the world's um, offshore oil production takes place in the Indian Ocean Basin. And we also talked about the, the natural resource rich Indian Ocean, fishing in the Indian Ocean region, aquaculture and all this mineral resource thing, right? Now let's discuss the strategic location thing. So this area is strategically very, very important because there's a strong security, security um, dimension to India's engagement with the Indian Ocean, like beyond all the traditional naval considerations of having a Navy, having a Coast Guard. If we look at it, um, there is like there is beyond all those um, considerations, 
there is a strong security dimension that India has created towards engaging with Indian Ocean. Okay, and one of the big reasons for that is like if you remember the uh, the, the the Indian coastal uh, policy underwent a big big transition after the 2008 Mumbai blast, which was perpetrated by terrorists, which arrived through sea, whereby the entire transition in the academia perspective towards Indian Ocean, the government's perspectives towards um, Indian Ocean region, the policy makers for the first time started talking about how significant and strategic is uh, um, the Indian Ocean region for India's growth, right? And a lot of non-traditional concerns in this region, such as smuggling, um, illegal fishing, human trafficking, piracy, that we talked about Somalia, the so, um, in region in the geographical map, right? Like the Somalian piracy, which affects towards the, the, uh, the um, Arabian and the African coast. And even in the Strait of Malacca, we have a lot of, um, to, towards the, the border of Indo-Pacific between Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, that strait also, there is a lot of pirate attacks that's happening, right? Now, other than that, like, there is also a lot of environmental degradation that's happening in this region. Because when we talk about ocean, we we kind of classify right you know it's very difficult to talk about um, an ocean in 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 the context of non traditional security threats non traditional concerns right because if i talk about non traditional security threats for indian ocean region i am kind of uh, separating indian ocean from all the other ocean geostrategically Geopolitically, of course, I can talk about Indian Ocean as a separate entity, Pacific as a separate entity. I can say that Strait of Malacca is the, uh, you know, the, the, the link that connects Pacific with Indian Ocean. And I can talk about uh, Suez Canal connecting, right? Like, but, but when it comes to non-traditional security threats, especially the environmental threats, it is Im nearly impossible to talk about oceans as five separate entities because the the differentiation called pacific atlantic indian all these are created by us humans for so that we can strategically understand the location but oceans are one body oceans are connected so the, if you go to like Pacific Ocean water and say that this is Pacific Ocean water or this is Indian Ocean water, it doesn't kind of apply to environmental concerns, right? So one of the key, but still, when it talk when I talk about um, uh, environmental concerns, we can specifically talk about certain concerns which are uh, very very um, authentic to the Indian Ocean waters, the waters which is near the Indian Ocean region because of as I said. Um, Indian Ocean is one of the warmest oceans. Because of this, what happens is that there's a lot of uh, ocean acidification that's happening. The ocean surface absorbs a lot of uh, carbon dioxide and the water starts heating, the surface water starts heating and a lot of chemical reactions happen. And it creates ocean acidification. And when oceans acidification, what happens? Most of the island reefs like Lakshadweep, Andaman, Nicobar, Mauritius, Seychelles, um, Maldives, all these, all these islands are coral islands. And when the ocean acidification happens, these islands start uh, corroding the coral uh, island starts corroding, right? So bleach started getting bleach. It starts bleaching, which means it's actually dying because corals are living beings. When it's get eroded means it's dying. And which is one of the reasons why Maldives is predicted to be, uh, you know, that it will be um, sunken by 2050. And again, talking about sinking, we, we also have to talk about global warming, right? as a big concern, uh, a non-traditional security concern, because security is not just human security from another country, right? Or a military security. We are also talking about human security. That right? if there is a flood that happens, a tsunami that happens, an earthquake that happens along the coast, human lives will be um, sacrificed. So it is again, one of the biggest uh, concerns, right? So uh, ocean pollution, 
so it, uh, the, one of the re reasons why i said that we are one ocean is because one of the bag that probably i will find in the indian ocean must have been thrown away on a beach in pacific or atlantic somebody threw it in us and it could reach the indian ocean because it's one connected entity right um, and uh, another thing is a lot of illegal unregulated uh, fishing that happens which is kind of uh, tampering the whole ecosystems of the uh, the the oceans right so these are a lot of non traditional security concerns which um, as students of um, uh, foreign policy um, i would suggest that you read up and you discuss in your peer groups and also write about because most of the discussions on security in india uh, is overwhelmingly the military security and it's not that it's um, you know not okay it's okay but we need to also add up a lot of literature from the non traditional security perspectives to kind of make security as a whole military security and non traditional security together can create human security and ensure that you know we all basically at the end of the day kind of survive as a society right um, so as i said maritime pollution maritime terrorism piracy and um, are you you fishing illegal unregulated fishing um we have uh, as i said ocean acidification so all these things uh, um, rise in sea level uh, bangladesh as we know it's one of like most of the coastal land is kind of getting sunk and lot of their food supply is kind of the entire food security is affected in the coast of uh, bangladesh because of the salinification like the sal water um oceanic water has salt right so salinification of water what happens is it enters into the groundwater so which kind of hampers the groundwater of bangladesh and it's happening in in india also if you look come to the uh, come to uh, you know rural um, coastal areas of tamil nadu kerala you can see that okay and so this is one of the biggest reasons um uh, you know why india has a lot of um, uh a um, lot of policies around identifying these non traditional concerns and kind of addressing it right and the hadar um, as you know um, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operation so india is actually playing a lot of active role uh, if you have heard about the vaccine uh, diplomacy that india was kind of Uh, india was kind of giving a lot of vaccines to uh, to lower income countries in in asia and southeast asia and when sri lanka had a lot of uh, uh, flood like situations the indian navy people went there and evacuated them right so uh, the indian navy specifically um, by policy policy wise is also looking at it it's one of the uh, this uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief is one of those wings of um, india's uh, you know policies towards uh, you know creating a benign uh, image in the indian ocean region um, as, uh, as 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 a power which is stable and as a power that can kind of take care of uh, the uh, you know the 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 other countries and other entities around right so this have been basically a, a very often focused on uh, rescuing citizens of uh, india from the conflict zones um, and, uh, and also uh, helping the citizens of other countries uh, in the process of it so and uh, there is a very recent uh, operation rahat that happened in yemen um, so this is again one of the uh, one of the uh, you know uh, examples of it uh, now when we talk about us and us asia pivot okay um so the in in 2000 uh, in, in, when when it was the um, obama administration obama wanted to enter into this trans uh, pacific uh, treaty with uh, the countries of uh, southeast asia between countries of southeast asia and us um so uh, as soon as trump came to power we also see that trump kind of um, uh, retracted from signing the uh, the policy and on his own kind of came up with something called asia reassurance uh, reassurance initiative act and here you see that uh, so there was a indo pacific strategy report the pacific strategy report that was released in 2018 so that was released by the us uh, department of defense and so in through that act 
the Asia Reassurance Initiative uh, through that report, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act or AIRA was released. Okay, so this kind of authorized around 1.5 billion US dollars uh, that US would spend on a range of programs, okay, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, East Asia, including Australia and Japan, uh, to develop uh, a long term strategic vision of US, okay, as a comprehensive, multifaceted, principled US policy for the Indo Pacific region. Now, what is this Indo Pacific region, right? For US, now that we're talking about US and its Asia pivot. So, the US considers the geographic expanse of the Indo Pacific to stretch from USA's western coast, if you look at USA's western coast, to the western coast of India. All right, so just imagine India, Indian subcontinent, so from the western coast of India to the western coast of US. Okay, so that is the Indo-Pacific according to US when we talk about Indo-Pacific strategy of US. Okay. And all these, uh, the Chinese actions um, in, in conflicts over Taiwan and its South China Sea disputes that's happening over Parcel Islands and Spartley Islands, right? So it's kind of not reflective for, for US. It's not really reflective of China's rise as a power, but also as uh, its growing hegemonic stance in the entire Indo-Pacific region. And one of the reasons why Asia pivot is, is something that uh, a lot of US strategists are basically talking about is that whether China's long-term strategy kind of seeks to replace the US as a global hegemon, we do not know because it's like they're playing number one, number two, still right. So it, we have to kind of wait and see what's going to happen. But it's kind of already uh, evident that China wants to build a, a Chinese sphere of influence in the entire Asian region, right? The, in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean region. We kind of know it through the BRI and all that, which we will discuss in the coming, coming slide. For a long time now, if you look at, the US has been a prominent power in the Pacific, right? Before the China's rise happened. Uh, and also in the Indian Ocean region, as I told um, you, until the 1990s. Now that China has kind of increasingly growing um, assertive in, in the Pacific Ocean and in the Indian Ocean region, uh, which is kind of challenging the powers such as US, of course, uh, also challenging, uh, challenging Japan, right? Like China, Japanese um, um, conflicts. And for Australia, one of the biggest concerns, of course, is Chinese uh, expansion. Now, this is in, and also, of course, um, though, um, you know, it's very, very evident that it is also a threat for India. Now, under President Biden, if we see that there is a notable shift in the US strategy in Asia Pacific compared to what was happening with uh, Barack Obama and uh, Trump. And to, to Biden, we can kind of see a lot of notable shifts. On the military front, if we see that US has, uh, you know, maintained and committed a lot of global uh, assets, especially maritime assets, a lot of maritime exercises are happening in the region between them. And um, the, in, there, there was a Indo-Pacific strategy report that was released three months ago by the White House, by the US uh, Agency of Defense, um, which basically said that uh, you United, it's very, uh, you know, very apparent. So this was like the in the report, you can just download it, go to Google and look at Indo-Pacific strategy um, a report, February 2022. Um, so the, the White House uh, website comes and you can download it there. So it says, it begins by saying the United States is an Indo-Pacific power. Okay, it's kind of like drawing the whole attention to, to the fact that, um, you know, US is an Indo-Pacific power. Okay, not just a Pacific power. Imagine United States do not have anything in, in Indian Ocean. Of course, the, the Diego Garcia Islands, of course, but, um, you know, 
there is no territorial you know it's not mere any of these places in indian ocean but when i why we are talking about indo pacific strategy is because us when it's pivoting to asia is also pivoting to indian ocean right now this region which is stressing from pacific coastline to the indian ocean coastline according to us is you know it's it's like um, it's it's one of uh, you know uh, a big um, american ally kind of a place right so this is almost home for uh, more than half of the world's population this region indo pacific um, nearly like seven biggest largest world militaries are there in this region between um, india and pacific right and a lot of american allies a lot of academicians have explicitly supported the us rebalance to asia the asia pacific the indo pacific okay and has only like kind of like a uh, kind of uh, you know um had a lot of critique about it now now what is india's response to all these things like india is kind of a kind of a like linchpin to this entire us uh, pivot policy right and has welcomed the us engagement in asia while there is an open endorsement of the us rebalance strategy in, towards asia it does not kind of uh, appear um uh, you know it's not like in a document that india has created okay but india and us have identified this region um where a lot of our interests between india and us kind of converge um and a lot of shared interest in this region and growth opportunities in the region along with a lot of security prospects now we will look at the uh, the expansionist policies of china in 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 especially in indian ocean region um and the repercussions of it um, you know um, to the whole uh, politics of uh, indian ocean so china has kind of like significantly expanded in the indian ocean region now over the past um, 3 to 4 decades if we look a lot of expansion has happened which has created a lot of insecurity um, amongst the indian policy makers and the american policy makers okay and china has also started increasing its naval presence in indian ocean region um and um so let's i can if if you can i can look at this so do you see this picture to the left to my left uh, where i have kind of you know taken this this pic um, this picture basically talks about the bri like the red part of it talks about the the road initiate the, the reviving of the old married uh, the silk road okay and the dotted blue line talks about the maritime silk road which kind of connects uh, the uh, europe the africa and the middle east to asia right to the right do you see this picture where there is a small um, string i believe you must have heard about the string of pearls um, strategy of um, uh, of china right like china's rise as a major uh, power in this region uh, has been kind of like you know it's kind of the talk of the town like all of us um, you know discuss or, or we hear these things being discussed even in the um, in the television channels and a lot of discussions around the string of pearls string of pearls string of pearls right so more so of this impact is seen in the maritime domain in indian ocean where china is currently kind of competing with the with the regional powers like india australia uh, india's uh, china's relationship with pakistan bangladesh myanmar vietnam right so a lot of regional powers also for kind of greater access to what china has created and what is called as a chinese string of pearls if you look at this picture it is like a chain which kind of surrounds india and especially india's indian ocean region presence so we if look at this number 12 here it talks about, it is the guadar port which is kind of getting developed and the from the guadar port is also 
um, you know, China's growth too. Like even in the left picture, do you see here this red corridor that you see the Sipak China Pakistan economic corridor, right? Which is one of which is kind of traveling through the park occupied Kashmir and can pose a lot of strategic issues to India's security. And we also know the Sri Lankan uh, uh, situation currently. So when we talk about Indian Ocean politics, we cannot talk about it without dealing with uh, the issues in Sri Lanka. Now, all of us know from newspapers and from reading the policy documents that Sri Lanka is in an all-time low. Uh, the, the entire economy has collapsed thanks to the lot of policies that Sri Lanka as a country as, as a political entity entered into with China. So this uh, popular thing called the debt trap diplomacy, which provided Sri Lanka with a lot of military advantages far from its shores, fra far from the shores of uh, China. China extended it to uh, Sri Lanka, promised economic growth, created a new port of Hambantota, like developed it, Though as per the policies, it was to create an uh, economic uh, and employment opportunities for Sri Lanka, but China got uh, its um, prisoners of war and prisoners from China in ships to Sri Lanka and constructed Hambantota. Hambantota was not constructed uh, by using the Sri Lankan, uh, you know, I can't use the word manpower, it's too gendered, but uh, the talent, Sri Lankan talent or Sri Lankan human power, it was not used. The Chinese um, uh, talent was used to kind of create Hambantota. And a lot of subsequent policies that the government entered with China was one of the reasons why the whole uh, Sri Lankan um, uh, uh, economy collapsed. And the same is going to happen to Pakistan and uh, through the Gwadar uh, port development. Right. So the the um, yes. So these discussions on uh, on 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 the growth on on China's um, you know constant uh, activity, which China kind of claims to be very peaceful, and it also says that it's kind of securing its own sea lines of communication, SLOCs, uh, kind of to 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 ensure its trade and its commerce and energy security. As I told you about the Malacca dilemma, the famous Malacca dilemma that China has, right? Like it is kind of scared about if something happens, if if India wants, India could just enter into an agreement with uh, Malaysia, right, and or Indonesia, and kind of. Uh, close the strait, which would be like choking Malacca, which means that it is like choking the whole power supply to or energy supply to uh, China. And fearing that China is kind of creating a lot of land routes, sea routes through Gwadar, so it doesn't have to depend on these things. It started with Hambantota, right? So securing to secure its sea lines of communication. So uh, though China says that, you know, listen, guys, we're not like, you know, I'm not, we're not doing this to, um, you know, to with any strategic uh, interest in mind, we're just doing it for our energy security, we're just doing it for our, uh, you know, um, our trade and our commerce, but the regional community, the regional players, the regional powers and the global powers are kind of not very convinced about the Chinese perspective towards doing all these um, developments. And over the last couple of decades, we see China has been kind of pushing for greater access and, uh, and greater presence in the Indian Ocean region through its maritime Silk Road. Like it has created a lot of uneasiness, uh, anxiety, insecurity in um, India, right? along with US, of course, but in India has created a lot of uh, uneasiness and insecurity. So although for China, the ultimate aims uh, in the uh, in the Indian Ocean region is kind of quite um, uh, not clear, uh, it's clear that they are acting they are pursuing uh, you know a lot of military uh, military uh, and military um, uh, missions in the indian ocean region which could be detrimental uh, to um, to the uh, to the countries in the region especially india and from the non traditional security and environmental perspective also if we look at the whole bri whole maritime silk road and every development in the string of pearls if you see china's promises to keep the climate goals in place 
China has made a lot of goals for uh, COP22, COP26, um, you know, a lot of policies that China has entered into. While it is following that in its own homeland, Chinese developments, infrastructural developments through BRI, including Maritime Silk Road, is using non-renewable sources of energy. All fossil fuels basically dirtying the, the climate, dirtying the atmosphere to another level in every country in, in Guadar. So there was a very, very uh, intense report that came up about how much coal and how much fossil fuels were used uh, in the whole CPEC route. To, to, to reach, to build the infrastructure from Gwadar to CPEC. While China's renewable energy uh, contribution is so big, like China is one of the highest contributors of uh, solar power. Um, in, in case of wind energy, China is world's number two for developing onshore and offshore wind. So with regards to renewable energy development, China is in some other level while talking about their own country but about polluting other countries it's so um you know shameless in kind of uh, creating all those uh, you know policies um so i have uh, a little bit of things on um when i talk about the politics of uh, indian ocean region i also wanted to talk um, you know talk about um two or three uh, regional and international agreements or associations, basically, um, if time permits. Okay, I hope I can talk a little bit. Um, okay, so um, one of the key organizations that deals with Indian Ocean uh, region is the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So it's an inter intergovernmental organization, which was established in 1997. And so it it has around uh, 23 countries, which is kind of, kind of bordering the Indian Ocean. So there are around 50, 55 countries in the whole Indian Ocean region, out of which around 20, 23 are kind of really uh, literal to India. Okay, like very, very bordering, um, uh, sharing the border with the Indian Ocean. So this was created to strengthen economic cooperation and with particular um, attention given, being given to trade and investment and social development of the region. Okay, and then um, SARC, I hope you know, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. So it was established in 1985. It's um, in uh, headquartered in uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. And it's it's again a, a regional intergovernmental organization like India is a part like there are eight countries there. So it also aims at developing and promoting economic um, development and a regional integration. Then uh, the next one is Bay of Bengal Initiative for uh, multi-sectorial technical and economic cooperation or popularly known as BIMSTEC. So BIMSTEC uh, is an international organization of there are around seven South Asian nations and seven Southeast Asian nations. Uh, uh, no, seven South Asian and uh, Southeast Asian nations. And uh, the main purview of uh, BIMSTEC is like the same, like trade, investment, energy. Uh, they have a lot of uh, um, projects on tourism, e ecotourism, uh, fisheries, development, agriculture, public health. Um, and, you know, cultural cooperation, like the soft diplomacy part and um, climate change. Um, so this is um, it. I think I've talked, I think I've talked too much and I should, <laughs> I should just, uh, you know, uh, let you, should I um, stop uh, sharing my screen? Okay, yes. Uh, no problem. Uh, uh, thank you for a very well thought out. Uh, I could say narration of Indian Ocean politics. And uh, now, after such an exhaustive and uh, elaborated account of the subject, now I would like to ask the students to come with the queries. I know they must be having a lot of queries because the subject is as such, uh, you know, raises so many queries from time to time. So now please 
who had raised your questions and be quick first introduce yourself and then uh, put your question uh, hello ma'am this is rishav gupta uh, can you hear me yes rishav i can hear you yes ma'am ma'am can I actually uh, uh, ma'am can a, can a, can a we india we in can a can a we india asean partnership build on a critical security framework ensure peace and prosperity in the in the in the indo pacific region sorry so you're asking me can india asean relationship be based on based on a based based on a critical security framework what is a critical non, security framework non, what do you mean by that traditional security framework ma'am essentially non -traditional. non traditional non traditional security uh, threat perspective yes so um, this is a very good question so actually i had written um, something uh, very recently which was published in a journal of uh, east asia where we talked about um, uh, india how india could build a very strategic uh, relationship with vietnam okay so vietnam and india could enter into a bilateral relationship which could be counterbalancing to china and pakistan so china is building the gwadar port in pakistan right through cpec and all that it's creating a lot of security dilemma for india right now what we proposed is that uh india similarly will enter into a strategic cooperation with vietnam which could be a counter balance now like if you look at the balance it is like this right china is now now we will also enter into an agreement with vietnam which could kind of balance the geostrategical play in indo pacific now um so there are a lot of papers that's written in the same area but what we suggested is that this relationship between india and vietnam should be on the basis of cooperative sustainable development which will cover all the non traditional security threats and policies to kind of appease all these issues so basically by addressing these non traditional security threats in indian ocean and pacific ocean india and vietnam can get into a relationship which is not necessarily just military in perspective okay but also uh, overall comprehensive which we termed as cooperative sustainable development by taking into consideration the united nations sustainable development goals i hope i have answered your question yes ma'am thanks a lot next question next one be quick let us not uh, detain our guest for long he has spoken for about an hour already so uh, Doctor Shani, uh, before we wind up, I have few queries about this subject, uh, and uh, naturally your narration has, uh, uh, I think, uh, given rise to many uh, questions. One is, how do you look at the slow progress of cooperation? among Indian Ocean region uh, states, uh, how they can move forward. What are the problems in slow uh, progress in cooperation? The pace has not been very, very, uh, I, I could say quick. It should have been more uh, quick, more quicker. And uh, uh, what more should be done so that uh, there is a lot of cooperation in various uh, areas among Indian Ocean region uh, states. Okay. So thank you for, uh, for this question. Actually, one of the reason, biggest reasons why the Indian Ocean region countries are not able to uh, cooperate with each other is because of security dilemma. So everybody is confused about what, why should I cooperate with another country? And if I cooperate on these grounds, will I be safe? And it is because of the uh, interferences of global powers, uh, uh, US and China, creating a lot of security dilemma in this region. So what I suppose is that if we can kind of build the relationship within Indian Ocean region, between bilateral relationship, on the basis of solving common problems, shared concerns, if we can start by building the bilateral relationship 
by solving the shared concerns, there will be more trust between countries. And once there is trust, there will be a better cooperative agreement because SARC can never be another ASEAN. When ASEAN was created, there was so much of trust with which ASEAN was created. So SARC still not as operational as uh, or as beneficial as um, ASEAN is for the Southeast Asian countries. SARC is not for um, India or Pakistan or uh, Sri Lanka. Even when the Sri Lankan crisis happened, nobody could do anything about it. Uh, when China was building this uh, um, um, port there, nobody could do actually do anything. But uh, when the Spartly and uh, the, the uh, Parsley and Spartly Island issue came, Philippines, Vietnam, everybody supported Philippines um, uh, appeal to the um, International Tribunal. So we, we need to like basically look at our shared concerns. So non-traditional security is one of the biggest uh, areas in which we could actually build that um, 